Okay, so today I want to talk about the disappearance of a 27 year old female from Mason City, Iowa. Her name was Jody Husenstrut, and she was a news anchor for KIMT news affiliate. And I was contacted by a member of I believe it's findjody.com. They are a great team of individuals who are looking into this disappearance now for the, I mean, it's been 25 years, I think, since Jody disappeared. And uh, this team is not letting it go, just like good investigators shall do. Um, very intriguing case. I, I believe it's either one of two things, but before we get into that, let's go right into victimology. And let's talk about what we know and what we don't know, or at least what I know. Again, I got most of my information from the Fine Jody team, who has a good collection. Um, just like the Ketty Murders uh, had a good collection, somebody, you know, these people that keep these websites going and collect information is... N not enough thanks goes to those type of people. Um, I find myself thinking right off the bat of a Facebook group run by a couple of admins, and I apologize, I don't know their full names, but uh, their first names I remember as Nick. And uh, the f Sherry... Uh, Sherry Joe Bates case that I worked on for the History Channel they do a, a great job of keeping that case alive and there's so many more there's so many more but those just came to mind and this fine Jody team has done uh, an exceptional job so what I was able to gather from newspaper articles and from this website and the stuff that the fine Jody team has sent me and you know what now that I was just thinking about it they were in a, there's an article in this magazine that was sent to me I got a bunch of these sent to me because uh, there was a couple pages uh, that the magazine did about me in here but Jody's case is in this magazine as well and I believe the girl's name who wrote this was Carolyn Lowe, and I believe that's who I've been exchanging emails with. And I just wanted to point that out because it's a very good article, a question and answer period. And if you can pick that magazine up somewhere from Unsolved, it's Unsolved Magazine, please do so. All right, enough of that, let's get into it. So victimology, what do we know? Well, from what I gathered, uh, she's athletic. I base that off of two things. I watched crime scene video of the inside of her apartment after it was released and seeing the golf clubs and the tennis rackets and also from high school when she played. Now she was 27 years old so she's about nine years removed from high school but she still could be very athletic. She actually was an avid golfer so now, some people say you don't have to be athletic to golf. I disagree. Anyway, I think she was athletic. She drank. Now, by drinking, 
I would like to know more about the extent of her drinking. By drinking, to me right now, it looks like she just did this socially. She went out a lot, a social butterfly. Um, not uncommon, especially for that age. And she hung around with her, seemed like a tight group of people. And, but she did drink. Now, there's no crime against drinking, obviously. If it would, I'd have been arrested a long time ago. So, why do I bring that up? Well, it can increase things. Um, it can impair things. Now, you'll come to find out what I mean by that in a little bit. So, by looking at her victimology, you would say right off the bat, maybe she's a low-risk victim, right? But I would tend to say that she was more of a moderate risk victim. Now, why? Why the jump? She was single, she frequented bars, and she was in the public spotlight. Being a news anchor, she was almost what you could consider a local celebrity. So, unfortunately, in this society that we live in, because of your high profile status, you sometimes are especially for females, you were sought out and fantasized upon and not looked upon for, your, for what you should be, which is an incredible human being who achieved their goals being a newscaster. So that, to me, makes her an elevated risk. She's not a high-risk victim, um, but, you know, it, it increases it a little bit. What also increases it a bit is she has said that she believed that somebody was following her. And she actually made a police report at one point in time that a white truck was following her. Now some accounts say it was a black truck, but for my research I want to say it was a white truck. Now this happened a few months before her disappearance, so it is unknown whether it is related or not. Um, but you cannot just dismiss it based on the amount of time from when it occurred. Now, let's get to the morning of her disappearance. Jody is supposed to be at work at 3.30 a.m. I know, crazy, right? Nobody wants to get up that early. She's ambitious. She does it. That's what time she starts. She did the morning news. So, at 3.30 she wasn't there so her co-worker must have gave her a 40 minute lead way before she called her at 4 a.m. the phone rang a long time Jody answered she was very groggy um, said she's sorry she'd be there as soon as she could I would like to know the exact words in that conversation even though it was a short window of time I would still like to know that but that is the gist of it. 7 a.m., 6 a.m., she's supposed to be there to do the news. I mean, she's supposed to be on air. So she's not there. The co-worker does the anchoring for her. After it, she calls the police or has somebody call the police to say, hey, something isn't right. She never showed up. Police get there. They find her car in the parking lot. They also find some disturbing items laying on the ground. By disturbing, I'm not talking about a murder weapon or anything like that. I'm talking the specific items. Her car keys, her red dress shoes, hair dryer, hairspray, and earrings are strung about near her vehicle. The key is bent, her driver's side mirror is bent out the wrong way. It is obvious that a struggle took place there. So what can we surmise right from there? Well, you can surmise that she was abducted and not killed there. There was no blood there. There was no indication that she was killed there. Can I say that 100%? Well, I guess you can't, 
because you could be strangled and killed there and no blood be left and then your body gotten rid of but that is highly unlikely that is not even probable in my eyes or possible because you would just leave the body there if you killed somebody right then and there um, if you look at the parking lot area of this apartment building she lived on the second floor her vehicle was parked 12 steps from that entrance so to me um, no she was abducted some other things that that tells you or it maybe gives you more questions than it does answers such as why are those items not in a bag to me if she's carrying look listen to all those items that she's carrying you know unless she had those shoes on her feet and she was knocked out of them which is a possibility that I didn't think of until just now that's what's beautiful about being able to talk this out more thoughts come to your mind victimology would probably tell you that um, whether she took her shoes to work I'm guessing she probably had those in her hands and not on her feet but the hairspray she certainly was carrying the hair dryer she was certainly carrying and the earrings and they're not in a bag so to me that could tell you that she was in a hurry and that would be backed up by her being late for work but we have to look into why she was late is there a reason for this again victimology would tell you that it had been brought out that she, I, I hate to use the word often because I don't think that's appropriate but she had been late to work before I am just curious about that aspect because somebody that has been when a victim goes missing people always talk in the best light of them always you 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 because it's normal you don't want to disparage or talk bad about a victim so sometimes maybe things don't get said such as sexual proclivity such as whether she or they I'm not talking about Jody I'm talking in general were a bad work performer anything like that so in this case it's been stated she was late to work I want to know whether that was chronic I want to know how many times that happened because that does not match the victimology or the imaging that I have of her to me it seems like it was a rare occurrence that changes things a little bit so I'll go back into you know the why she possibly was carrying the items didn't have them in a bag so on and so forth that's basically it for the disappearance nothing else except for one thing that intrigues me an individual named John Van Nice Van Sice and I say his last name only because it is public record again I am a, a firm advocate of not putting people's names associated with a true crime case unless it's already out there um, because I think it's unfair to label somebody a suspect when there's no real evidence against them until they're convicted or until you know their name is brought up in some sort of public uh, form but even then you know with the with the internet it's it's tough anyhow I just don't like doing it but in this case I am because there's a lot of information about this guy that's been 
not just on the internet. I'm talking 48 hours, seen by millions of people. Fair or unfair to him. He came forward. He was a friend of Jody's. He, while the police are at the apartment conducting their investigation, he shows up there. And he shows up there to say, hey, Jody was at my place last night. We watched a video, which was 18 minutes in length, I come to find out, which is important. And I think I was the last to see her. I'd want to know whether he said I was the last to see her or I was the last to see her alive. Because if he does that within an hour of her disappearance or something, I got a problem with that. I don't know if he said that. But him going to the scene is one of two things. He is an awfully concerned friend. And I would want to know had any other friends showed up there. Two, he's injecting himself into the investigation. So if he's doing that, I want to know what questions he's asking. What have you found? So on and so forth. Now he does have an alibi from at 6.45 or 6 o'clock a.m. when he received a phone call and then he went for a walk with a female friend who testified years later at a grand jury and she has stuck by her word that he was with her. Now, just because he's with her at 6.45 or he answers a phone call at 6 does not mean he is not involved. She went missing. She was abducted. I'm going to say roughly around 4.30. Now, neighbors did hear a scream between 4.30 and 5 o'clock. They did not investigate or call police. Now, it's not unusual. There's a campground nearby. There's a lot of apartments you know hindsight's 2020 yes call the police but they didn't think anything of it more than likely probable that that was Jody screaming now I want to look into the 24 hours before this disappearance who did she see what was she doing what did she do that could have possibly caused her to miss work essentially she says she overslept but why was she a deep sleeper well let's look at the 24 hours previous to this at 6 a.m. the previous day so about 24 hours previous she did her normal news feed after that at 9 a.m. she attended a fundraiser which was a golf outing now she was at this golf outing all day I don't believe she golfed all day, but she was there. She left that golf outing at least one time in order to change clothes. She came back and ended that function at 8 p.m. that night. That's a long day, okay? 6 a.m. to 9. Now, she's 27. You know, hey, I would have a hard time doing that without about two naps in between there. But again, I'm 47 years old. She's 27. So, victimology would tell you that too. Whether she could, what her stamina was. Now, 8 p.m. is when things kind of get murky. Because that's when John Van Syce says she came to his place to watch a video. The video was of a birthday party that they had had previously. At 8.24, she makes a phone call from her house. Now, is this doable? Okay, that's the first thing we got to look at. Is it possible that she leaves this function and instead of going home, she goes to John's house to watch this video. I think I have a better time believing that than her going home, leaving her home, going to John's, and then returning home. So, it certainly fits. She's done at 8. On the way home, she stops at John's to watch this video. Now, John's relationship to her is kind of friendly. 
By friendly, he's 22 years older, I believe, than Jody. At least 20 years older. I've come across a lot of cases like this in that a girl may just want a friend but the friend wants out of the friend zone and they think I've done everything I buy her drinks I take her water skiing which is what he did previous to this he even said he named his boat after her now that's odd behavior in my mind yet in someone else's mind like John's that might not be abnormal regardless they had a friendship now if you look on this map you will see the distance between Jody's apartment I believe it was 600 North Kentucky Ave and I believe where John was living at the time that's a short distance could she have gone there at 8, watched the 18 minute video, then been home by 8.24. Absolutely. Absolutely could have been done. Because you got to remember, John is guesstimating. Yeah, she, and now granted, he's not being interviewed 10 years later. It's that, the next day. It's the day of. And he says she was at my place at 8 o'clock. I'm sure he wasn't watching the clock. It could have been 7.55. But the firm time that we have is 8.24, where she was home. Now, why would he say this if it wasn't true? Now, some people will say, well, he's interjecting himself into the investigation. He was seen with Jody. Therefore, he's got to come up with a reason. Well, why wouldn't he say, I seen Jody at 4 o'clock in the morning? Yes, that does sound suspicious to be seeing her. Um, but why would he say 8 o'clock the previous night if it wasn't true? There would have to be a reason for him to do that. He could interject himself by just showing up at the crime scene and saying, Hey, what's going on? She's my friend. But he goes further than that and says she was at my house. So I believe that to be true. I believe Jody did go to his house. But what I want to do is focus away from his house and look at Jody's apartment. To me, there are some things there that doesn't make sense to me. I, like I said, it stated, I watched the quick couple minute video of Jody's apartment, the inside of it, after it was released from police custody. And it was videotaped by a news station that was given access. Couple things didn't make sense to me in there. Now, what I didn't see, but I have heard right from a police officer's mouth, was the toilet seat was up. That bothers me a lot in this case. What does that tell you? It tells me that there was a male in that apartment. Is there any other explanation? Sure, I can come up with two, three, three right off the top of my head. She was cleaning and left it up. Doubtful, because 
I'm sure she would have. She's not coming home from a 16 hour day cleaning and then not using the toilet in the meantime. So we could wipe that out. Number two, she was sick. Did she have too much to drink that night? That's the reason she was late and she threw up in the toilet. Yes, that's that's possible. Okay? I'm going to leave that as possible. The third reason is she had a guy there. Or, now that I'm thinking about it, number four, which believe it or not, believe it or not, this could happen. And I've seen it happen. That's how I know. You're at a crime scene. It's not a murder per se because you don't know. Just a missing person, whatever it is, a burglary, a law enforcement officer using the bathroom. It's natural habit to put up a toilet seat. So you have to take that in consideration. But why I'm watching this video of the inside of her apartment, I see a very tidy apartment except for the kitchen table where I see a Pepsi can knocked over. But it looks like it could have been knocked over by the shoving of some paperwork that's there. Victimology. Did, did she drink Pepsi? Okay, I'd want to know that. But let's go back over to the counter. I want to see indications of somebody else being there. I had a burglary one time of a, a high-profiled uh, individual in the community. And they had a house sitter. When I got there and looked around, she said, hey, I was here, I don't know, no, I left for a while, could have happened then, but I had nobody here. I looked and I saw two plates that had remnants of pizza on it. I looked in the dishwasher and I saw that there were 15 glasses. I knew that she had people there. She definitely had one person there, probably had a party. I, that's what I want to know in this. Did the police look for that? I'm sure they did. But what I see there on that counter, right here that I'll show you, is two cans. Well, they look like cans. The video is blurry. But one looks like a Pepsi can, which is consistent with what's on the table. And I'm going to assume that that's Jody. But look at the can that's in front of it. And when it's in front of it, it also means to me that it was drank more recently than the Pepsi. If that was another Pepsi can, it wouldn't intrigue me too much. But it's something else. As if maybe there was a visitor there and they were drinking that. Now it could be totally innocent. It could have been Jody drank it. Okay? I don't know. But when you're looking for clues... You have to look at everything. Another thing that bothers me is when we go into Jody's bedroom. Now what do you see here? I'll tell you what I see. The bed's made. The victimology will tell you that, but wasn't she in a hurry? So why is the bed made? If she was in such a hurry that she took her hair dryer, she took shoes, she took earrings, all in a hurry to get to the station. Why is her bed made? Did she shower before she left? The police have to have that in their report. They should have checked the bathroom, the bathtub, to see if it was wet. Because that gives you a, a different frame of her mind. I'd also want to know from her co-workers, okay, if she's running late, how frantic is she to get to work? Does she have to rush? Why didn't she put her earrings in and do her hair, blow dry it, if she took a blow dryer with her? Why didn't she do that at the house? Is it because she was in a hurry? And if so... Why did she make the bed? 
Could it be that she had a visitor there who slept in her bed, made the bed, and left? And she slept on the couch. Nah. See, I'm just trying to throw some thoughts out there. That doesn't make too much sense to me because you would find a blanket more than likely somewhere, if not on the couch, but somewhere else. But she made that bed, and that bothers me. Now, victimology would tell you that. Talk to her mom. Did she make her bed when she was a kid? You know, was that normal for her? Maybe all it took was... For... Now, if you've seen my bed right now, you would say, hey, it's, it's a total mess because blankets and pillows are everywhere. But some people don't sleep like that, right? It's just all they have to do is pull the blanket over. So maybe that's all it was, and I'm making too much of it. But it's something that stood out to me. Other than that, there does not look like there's a struggle at all. You know, and, and why is that? Well, because everything happened outside. But there could be clues on the inside of that apartment that we just went through that could help you determine what happened on the outside. So did she have somebody stay there with her that night? And if she did, is he responsible? Well, that's hard to say. But if you go with the possible versus probable, I would say no. If she had somebody staying there with her that night, and he wanted to, to do harm to her, he would do that harm inside the apartment building. Inside the apartment. Instead, he's not going to wait till she leaves and chance being seen and abducting her then. That doesn't make sense. So to me, it has to come it comes down to two things. It was someone that she was with that night. Or a stalker. Those are really the only two options. Now, a witness came by who went by that apartment building around the time that Jody went missing and said he saw a white van, which I'll show a picture of here, that was in the parking lot just during the time frame that Jody was being abducted. Now, the witness said it had its parking lights on. That bothers me, too. The reason that bothers me is because if you're abducting somebody and you're lying in wait, you are not having any lights on in the interior or exterior of that vehicle. Now, there could be some exceptions to that. Let's say he just got there and he was backing in. He turned the headlights off but left the parking lights on. And that's right when the witness saw it. Very good possibility. I am sure the police went through every occupant in that apartment building to see if they owned such van. I'm sure they did that and the answer they got is probably no or they would not have released this information. Number two. Look at this picture of the front door of Jody's apartment. This is going into her apartment building. Or not her apartment building, her actual apartment. That's solid double lock you're not forcing your way in there so if she is being stalked there is only one way to get her and that's when she exits the building you cannot make entry into her apartment okay so that to me leads credence to the stalker theory another thing that I see in this photograph here of the crime scene and these are all actual pictures of the crime scene there was a couple um, that I, I looked at and thought about using that were recreations but takes away the authenticity of this video 
and it could be a misrepresentation of the actual scene because what I wanted to know is the exact locations of those items that she was carrying where were they there was drag marks that police saw which shows that she was abducted she was pulled away the key being bent is besides the mirror the best indication she was pulled forcefully before she entered she was unlocking her vehicle got the key into the lock and then was abducted and with such force that it bent the key so let me go through my notes here just because it's going to jog some things in my memory to talk about uh, like I always do Jody Huenstrand 27 victim June 27 1995 went missing she was declared legally dead in 2001 her victimology we talked about um, the profile this is a hard case um, to profile and I did read well, I didn't read the actual profile or what was talked about but I've seen there was a podcast of some sort that a retired FBI criminal profiler did I think a profile or at least talked about it I didn't listen to it because I never want to be biased going into any of my assessments and there's not much that I can take from it um, other than I would say that they have no job whoever did this or worked you know a night shift uh, or an afternoon shift no, definitely not a morning shift because this was a Tuesday I want to say most people at Tuesday you know at 430 in the morning are sleeping getting ready to go to work in this case the person had to have known that Jody was going to be there this is not a crime of opportunity we can rule that out a person is not going to be sitting there or driving by at 4.30 in the morning and happen to see her and say, I'm going to decide to abduct her. Especially when she is 12 steps from when she exits her apartment building to her car. And also the lights. Look at the lights here on the outside of that. I'd like to know whether they were motion censored lights or just lights that were on all the time because if they were lights that were on all the time that almost is shining directly on where this happened and it didn't deter this offender and if that's the case to me it means they were stalking her and they had this fantasy in their head of how things were going to go what they were going to do he had probably sat in that parking lot before so we can assume that the the offender didn't have a job also I can assume or like I said I can't say for sure no job I can say that either no job that morning had off that day or worked a later shift now does that get you any closer eh, maybe maybe not but you don't want to make up things in your crime scene assessment or criminal profile just to sound like you know what you're talking about you have to rely on what you know on facts I can also say that he probably is single now why do I say that I can't say for sure but I can say he had no accountability so not having accountability could be that he is married but nobody's watching him he can freely get up at 3 30 in the morning 4 30 in the morning and and do this deed without repercussion you know without somebody saying well, where are you where you been that's why i say more than likely single that's about it that's about all i can say on a criminal profile aspect others may say more i won't go there some people have ventured to say, well, he was a, like we saw in the Molly Bish case, well, he was a hunter and a fisherman. <laughs> no, I won't go there. 
The items around the car, I went through red shoes, hair dryer, hairspray, car keys, earrings. Indicates I have here she was in a hurry, but yet her bed was made. That bothers me. Did she shower? I want to know that. I'm going to say if she showered, that's why she brought the hair dryer with her. Um, again, I would, I would want to know her sexual proclivity. You're not going to get that from family. I've gone through this hundreds of cases. The family will say, no, no, no. Her friends will give a different story. And the truth is in between. Okay? Everybody has needs. Is it unfathomable that she brought somebody back to her apartment that night? Was she drinking at this golf event? Was she intoxicated? When she went to John's house that night, did she drink? Those are all things that I would want to know. The timeline we went over. The lights on in the entrance way. I have a big asterisk by because I think that is important because it tells you the offender wasn't deterred at what he was planning to do. If she was stalked, um, I believe that that's a possibility and I'll tell you what I think at the end here. Like I said, or it was somebody that she was with that night. If it was somebody she was with that night, the possible component to make him snap would be a rejection. But I don't see an abduction taking place. If she had somebody there in that apartment that night who did her harm, whom rejected her from sexual advances, whatever it was, Maybe the rejection was as simple as, hey, I'm late for work. Get out of my bed and hit the street. I got to go. Possible. Not probable. John Van Sice, her friend, I have down here. He named his boat after her. Talked to her in the, talked about her in the past tense after one day. I'm not going to say for sure he did that. I heard that, um, but I can't confirm that. If he did that, yes. That certainly raises an eyebrow, but I had cases where that has happened before, and they had nothing to do with it. I'm talking missing person cases. Why would he take her forcefully? That's what I have written down here. If he was involved, let's say his involvement is rejection. He's rejected by her maybe the previous night. Would he, in fact, he knows where she lives. And in fact, when I looked up his address, because I wanted to know how far he lived from her, I saw this address, which is the key apartments where Jody lived. So he certainly knew where she lived. I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything whether he's was ever inside her apartment. But the relationship between those two is something that I would certainly want to know more about. Was she stringing him along? You know, he's buying her beer, buying her, doing these things, taking her places. And do you think that he's doing that out of the goodness of his heart? No way. No way. There's a motive for why he's doing that. And if she rejected him because of that motive, would he go over there that very next morning, lie in wait? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because let's say, let's say he was upset at 8 o'clock that night if she rejected him. 
Would he not then go over to her apartment, knock on her door? She would let him in. Or if they had a fight at his apartment, he would still go to the apartment, her apartment, and knock on the door. I, I think. I can't see him lying in wait at 4.30 in the morning to do something to her. There's a lot of weird things about this guy. But to me, from what I see right now, with the evidence that I see, I would rule him out. Now, I see that the police did a search warrant on his vehicle in 2017. They put a GPS locator on that. And why did they do that? I mean, I've done that in cases. You do that because you're hoping that the offender will revisit the body. Drive by the body. Something. They didn't get anything from that. Should he be a suspect? Absolutely. Absolutely. So they had to have gotten enough probable cause in order to get a search warrant. That's not hard, folks. That's not hard. Uh, this case here that I worked for 10 years, I was able to get search warrants on at least seven different suspects based on probable cause. Not all seven committed the crime. Maybe none of them did. I'm pretty sure one of them out of those seven did. But I was able to articulate enough probable cause in order to get a search warrant. So, I think the police did a great job of following that up and, and him being a suspect. Again, if he has nothing to do with this, it's another man's life that's ruined and that's a shame. It's a, it's a shame that that happens to people. And there's just no way, there's no way around it. If your name is brought up in an investigation and something suspect about you, you're ruined. I wish there was a way to curb that. I really do. Law enforcement rumors. There was a rumor that three law enforcement individuals, three police officers were involved in this disappearance. Um, I, I think that's ludicrous. Not because they were law enforcement. Golden State Killer, there's other law enforcement officers who have committed crimes like this. But three of them. There's three people weren't there to abduct her. It makes no sense. Okay? Now, if they wanted to say, well, one law enforcement officer and there was other things to back it up, well, yeah, I would take that into consideration, but... I think that's ludicrous. In big crimes like this, and by big I mean out in the media, public, famous, infamous cases, especially through the years, there are so many rumors that get interjected. They could start at a party, sitting there drinking, start talking about the case, and just say, yeah, well, those cops are corrupt. They pulled me over one time for a DUI. I wasn't even drunk. And they did this, they were probably involved. Then next party, that guy goes to and says, yeah, I was talking to a guy last night. He said the cops were involved, three of them. You know how that drill goes. You tell somebody a story, and then by the time it gets to the 10th person, it's completely different. Imagine being an investigator doing a crime like this and trying to investigate all the rumors. That's why you got to strip all that shit away and go right to the facts. The van in the parking lot, parking lot with the lights on. 18 minute video I have down here. Car 12 feet from the entrance. So, do I know what happened to Jody? No, I do not. I can say that it was more than likely, we certainly can deduce it to somebody she was with in that apartment but there's no indication other than what I'd pointed out the toilet seat possibly the can but 
Other than that, there's no indication anybody else was there. If somebody else was there, wouldn't they have come forward? It's not a murder yet. It's a missing person. So that day, wouldn't they have called police and said, hey, I was with her that night? Yes, you would think they would. But sometimes they don't want to be involved. They think they're going to be a suspect and they don't want that scrutiny. Is it possible that Jody did not have a, let's say, a she wasn't in a relationship? Is it possible that she had a one-night stand? Hey, that's not disparaging or discrediting her reputation. That's stating, could it have happened? If it could have, maybe that person did not come forward. But, if I had to make a guess going through all that, and an educated guess based on my training and experience, based on what the limited information that I see, I would say no. I would say that there is a reason for the toilet seat being up. And it, it has nothing to do with another person being there. Although we can't rule that out. The can being where it is, being different Pepsi, it's not a true indication of somebody else being there. It could be. I think that it's more likely than not that she was abducted by a sexual predator stranger. By that, I mean I believe that that white van more than likely was responsible I would like to know where that white van was parked, if there were any other vehicles parked right next to Jody's car. This person had to act quick. She's in a hurry. She comes out that front entrance to her car. She makes it to her car. She has her back turned to the individual, more than likely, again, I don't know where that white van was. But he approaches her from the back, such force that it bends the key, she drops everything, and he drags her. Now, where are the drag marks? Are they up over those curb uh, parking concrete steps? Or is it the other way? To give you an indication of where the van was. Initially, when I started looking at this case, my immediate thing was look for somebody in that apartment, in that apartment complex. I see that all the time. But usually that's not in abductions. That's in murders, where somebody is found outside in a stairwell, in, a, in the grass behind the property, or inside the apartment. For abductions, that's not usually the case. So that's it. That's that's what I've got for this case. If more information comes forward to me that I'm not privy to, I would take it obviously into consideration. One thing I didn't speak about too much was I did not watch the video, the 18-minute video of Jody at this at her birthday party. According to somebody that I hold in high respect, uh, Jim Clemente, who was a, he's a former FBI criminal profiler, and he was a writer for the the show Criminal Minds, I think. But he, more than that, he was a member of my American Investigative Society of Cold Cases team, and I've had time to, I've shared a lot, some time with Jim, and I've looked at some of his works. I've listened to him give speeches and I have I have a high amount of respect for Jim and I know that he was quoted as saying that during this video that Van Sice had laser focus on Jody 
when she w danced with somebody else, he was staring her down and got upset. Um, I take his word for that because I didn't watch the video. If, if I could obtain it, I certainly would, but I, I couldn't find it. Um, so, does that change my assessment? It does not. Not that video alone. You know, I certainly would still like to watch it. But to me, I think that you could rule out John Van Nuys, not totally, um, but I don't see him... I don't see him abducting her at 4.30 in the morning. He had plenty of opportunity to do so, let's say from 8 o'clock that night when she's at his apartment until 4 in the morning, he could go to her apartment. He doesn't have to wait is my thing. An abduction like this to me is more indicative of a stranger. Sad case. Such a promising life snuffed out. Could she still be alive? I think that's possible. Um, we've seen cases where, you know, Amanda Berry, uh, Sean was Hornbeck, Elizabeth Smart, people that have been abducted and found later on alive, usually at least in those cases, the victim is usually younger. But Jody being 27, you know, I would probably agree with the courts who declared her dead in 2001. Um, it, it's a shame. It really is. That's it. That's my assessment on the case. I think that it was a uh, stranger sexual predator abduction. Um, I can't give any indication as to where they lived. I'm assuming they lived in that area or at least where that news broadcast reached to. And they're able to research where she lived and they had stalked her and been in that apartment building. Probably passed her in the hallway and she didn't even know it. That's the scariest thing. You know, she probably said hi to him due to her bubbly personality and not knowing that, you know, he didn't set his his fantasy in motion yet. He had fantasized about this probably every time he watched the news, taking a step every single day, a different step, okay? I watched her. Now I'm gonna masturbate to the TV image. Now I'm gonna go to her apartment building. Now I'm gonna go into her apartment building. Now I'm gonna say hi to her. All the way progression until he felt comfortable. He wasn't deterred by the outside light. He knew he had watched her leave that building many times. And finally, before he set his motion or his actions in motion, he did on June 27, 1995. And the rest is history. Do I think the case will be solved? I think it's very, very likely. Uh, so... I wish I had the actual police report and files on this case. So if anybody has them, get a hold of them, get them to me. I'll do another video to see if anything changes. But if, as of right now, stranger abduction, sexual predator homicide, unfortunately. So with that, hey, mains out.